As founder and editor of the City Pages, our first speaker has been an incredible source of value and vibrancy for our community. She's a great cobbler together of disparate points of view from around central Wisconsin, and she's here tonight to speak about making pasta sauce. Please welcome <laughs> Tammy Stasinski. Ben only knew that because we did a run-through of the sound checks, so, <laughs> and I did part of my speech. But it really is about, um, about sustainability. You heard um, um, Mr. Johan Rockstrom, was his name, talk about global sustainability, but we're bringing it down locally and personally here tonight. And um, we're talking, I am talking about um, self-sustainability. And uh, it starts with a story about pasta. Yesterday I was making um, homemade spaghetti sauce to preserve, that is to can, in jars. First time I'd ever done it. I'd done other canning, but this is the first time I did marinara. So my sons and I cut up pounds and pounds of Roma tomatoes, some bell peppers and garlic and onions and basil, and we roasted them in the oven for, for hours. It's a real nice, easy way. You get it all done, you shove it in the oven. And then I set up, the, uh, after a few hours, I set up the uh, hand-cranked food mill that I had bought a few weeks ago from Fleet Farm, one of my favorite stores of all time. And this is a wonderful contraption uh, because you just shove in the, the fruits and vegetables and you just crank it and then out comes this wonderful sauce or juice. And I, and I had uh, used it about three, work, three weeks earlier and it helped us make very easily about 20 quarts of organic homemade applesauce from apples that we had gotten from a wild apple tree that was growing on my parents' farm about 50 miles east of here, near Shano. So by the time I was ready to send this tomato vegetable stew through the food mill, the kitchen was a total disaster. Anyone who's canned, or you, you know what it's like. The, the kitchen was full of dirty pans and baking sheets and knives and bowls, and there were cutting boards everywhere, because each of my sons had to have their own cutting boards. And the evidence of all this, these hours of work was all around me. And so I turned that hand, that hand mill, and out of that mill came this beautiful, deep red, aromatic red sauce for all of the work I've done. Here it came out, and there I was with about a jar and a half of red sauce. <laughs> so, now I'm not here to diss um, home canning and food preservation, um, just the opposite, in fact. Um, because in truth, like with anything, there's an economy of scale with home cooking. And I could have easily have gotten six times that amount, maybe eight quarts, a good winter supply, if I had just cooked some more vegetables and, and done, done more. But this was my first time canning marinara sauce, and next time I'll know better just how much those tomatoes cook down and how much I have to start with to make all that time worth the effort. Now I know how to do it, and now I own that. And why make the effort? Why spend hours to preserve that amount, that amount of food that realistically you could buy for maybe $30 if you spend all day, or in my case, uh, maybe $9 worth of red sauce for all that trouble? And the same goes for even less time-intensive things. I mean, why make a cake or pancakes from scratch when the mixes are so easy and not very expensive? Why bake your own pie when the grocery stores bakery has them ready? Why make your own soup when you can just add hot water or open up a can? Because there's a big difference between buying these things out of convenience and buying them out of helplessness. My career as a journalist means that I've spent much of my life observing, and I've spent most of my personal time learning life skills. And this goes back to my childhood working and growing up on a family dairy farm where every day we took care of the animals, we milked cows, worked the land, and I would help my mother sew and cook. And as a business owner and an entrepreneur, I was forced to learn a lot about things like bookkeeping and labor laws and all those things in the beginning because we just couldn't afford to pay someone to do that for us. We couldn't afford to have a, an accountant or an attorney on hand. We had to do that ourselves. So from what I've observed <clears throat> over the years is that so many people today, especially young people, have so few skills to be self-sufficient, even on a small scale, even on, even on those little day-to-day -day things. And in today's economy, we've all heard so much about what it takes to survive, 
that you need to have certain job skills, certain job hunting and interviewing skills, and those are critical. But I'd also argue that life skills now are more important than ever. Think of your life as a little economy of its own. To be healthy and resilient, it must at some level not be so dependent on everything else. And certainly we need trade, just like as in a big economy. You know, we need trade to provide things that we just can't provide ourselves. You know, I'm not advocating going back to pioneer days or anything like that. But if we are helpless on so many different levels, on so many day-to-day -day levels, not only do we feel weak, but I think we also can have this nagging feeling of resentment toward what some people say is the man. Because we, we feel helpless. And think about how many hundreds or thousands of dollars does a person throw away over the years because he didn't know how to remove a stain or fix a tear or fix a button on that shirt? How much do we spend on unhealthy fast food because we have no idea how to fix a simple cheap meal at home? How much do we spend because we don't know how to build a simple set of shelves or change the oil in a car? And how much do we lose because we don't know, say, the basics of budgeting and home money management or credit? Um, one of the tragic things that I've come to see over the years, and this was also through my work um, through United Way, I volunteered for an organization called um, Women in Action. And it's a spin-off of, of United Way, and we work very closely with a lot of uh, disadvantaged families in town. And one of the tragic things that I've come to see over the years is that how so many people, especially lower income, but not necessarily just lower income people, pay thousands and thousands of dollars more for things just because they have a lousy credit rating, just because they mismanaged maybe years ago a couple credit cards because they didn't know the very basics of a checking account or, or credit cards. When you have poor credit, you pay a much higher rate on your home mortgage or a car loan for, say, a $25,000 car loan over five years at a, good, at a good credit rating, at a good interest rate, you pay about $3,300 of interest over, over that five years if you have a good credit rating. But if you don't, you're paid a much higher interest rate, some, in some cases much, much higher say at 7.5%, then instead of paying $3,300, you're going to be paying over $5,000 a year. I mean, about $5,000 over five, over five years. So, that, so it's almost as if, if you have a bad credit rating, every couple years you have another you know, $1,700 bill that you have to pay only because you didn't know enough to manage your finances. It gets even worse if you're talking at a home mortgage. For a 30-year home, home mortgage of, say, $150,000, the difference in one or two percentage points, the difference between having a very good credit rating and having not so good credit rating, is fifty to $70,000 over 30 years. I mean, that's, think what you can buy, and that's, and you can ruin your credit rating by just some very simple things that people aren't taking the time to learn. And these are lessons that most people don't learn until it's too late. Now there are two things that I think are lacking in the general common knowledge of, uh, of society today. And I think one is that measure of self-sufficiency, and the other is a spirit of ownership. And we've all heard it again and again, that we are a society of consumers. And you've also probably heard again and again that schools these days are teaching our children to be good workers, to grow up to be ready for the workforce. And that has always annoyed me. <clears throat> How about training our children and even training ourselves as adults to be owners? And not necessarily meaning that your ultimate goal is to own a business, although you know, that would be good to get there, but, but even the possibility of owning land or, or taking into account an ownership of a special skill and owning that. And that spirit of ownership can have really modest roots. In my personal experience, I actually felt that there was little um, mystique in starting my own business, a weekly newspaper in Wausau. And at first it was because growing up on a family farm, well, family farm is a business. And so I was surrounded by the basics of production and management and operations and expenses and you know, milk prices. That was our life. Second, I worked my way through college at a startup pizza restaurant 
in Madison. And I was one of the first employees. And I shared their ups and their downs, and I understood their costs and expenses. So the concept of ownership was something I had always been surrounded by. Now others might not have had those kinds of experience, experiences, but as I said, the concept of ownership can have very modest roots. A few days ago, there was a program on National Public Radio, and I, I think it was Talk of the Nation. And they were discussing the decline of home economic classes in today's schools. You know, the classes where teens learn the basics of cooking and sewing and laundry and basic money management, things like that. Um, fewer and fewer schools are having them. I, I frankly don't know um, in the Wassa School District if they have much of that or if it's been scaled so bad that they don't do it. I, I don't know. I just know in general the trend is, is getting away from that. Well, one listener recounted how her home ec class when she was in school was considered a joke. But then, a few years ago, she, she uh, said on air, she lost her job as an interior designer when the economy tanked. And then she found herself falling back on those basic sewing skills she had learned in home ec class. And she began to sew her own window treatments and taught herself to do those basic skills, how to do the specialized things. And with those skills, she, those skills that she owned, she didn't even know she owned them, but she did own them. And she was able to make ends meet while she was between jobs for two years. For two years, she went back to those skills and she found a way to make them work for her. She discovered that she owned something valuable, something that she used to think of as a joke. And I think one big difference when you have a sense of ownership and how you view everything. If you have a sense of ownership, one big difference is, I think, is how you spend your time and money. Some people's homes, and I'm sure um, maybe even ourselves, are filled with clutter of stuff that, um, that maybe we have bought during recreational shopping trips to Walmart or, or Target. And sadly, it is true that often the people who can least afford it really do spend money as a leisure activity. And I, I know this from a couple um, different cases. I had been uh, talking to uh, Jackie Caratini, who is the family living agent at the UW um, Extension, which is, by the way, the UW Extension is a very, very valuable resource for the things that I'm talking about here. And they do budgeting classes. And Jackie had told me that she has almost given up forcing people when they're doing their budgets, she's almost given up forcing people to get rid of their Walmart shopping trips. Because she says, for so many people, this is their only leisure time. And so it's all, she said, to be realistic, she says she almost has to just let it go and just say, okay, if you can't give up your $70 a month that you're gonna blow at Walmart because that's your leisure time, we'll just have to work around it. Which I thought was a very telling, a telling statement. Um, and she worked with a lot of people, so this isn't just a, an anecdotal thing. This is something that happens. Well, anyway, so, so a person's house can be filled with a lot of clutter that they, that they don't need. In my house, the most cluttered place in my house is my work basement, where I have um, a bunch of power tools and hand tools and wood and various home construction items that I have bought during the 18 years of renovating our 100-year-old home. Because for me, my... Day, my, my dream shopping trip is to go to Home Depot or Menards or Fleet Farm. So, but I bought these things, envisioning what these things would produce for me. And this big investment that we now owned, which was our house, a house that we were fixing up. So because I had the sense of ownership, and ownership and also what I was buying, these things were going to work for me. These things were going to make me money because I wasn't going to have to pay someone else to do the work. And they have produced tens of thousands of dollars in home improvement, improvements that I could do myself, and I have done myself, rather than hire out. And tools that I bought 10 or 15 years ago are still producing for me today. Although, truth be told, with little kids now, I don't have as much time to do those things, but they're still, the tools are still waiting there for me, and my sons are trying to learn how to use them too. When people shift their thinking towards self-sufficiency and ownership, you begin to measure things by their potential return. One person who really believes in the power of ownership is a man named Steve Mariotti, who is the founder of the nonprofit Network for Teaching Entrepreneurship, which is based, I believe, in Brooklyn. And he teaches 
His program teaches um, business and ownership skills and entrepreneur skills and concepts to disadvantaged youth in 18 states. And he recently wrote, Professional business owners, venture capitalists, and private equity firms have a distinct advantage in the creation of wealth because they can sell the profits generated by workers for a multiple of a business's earnings. One dollar of profit can become, can become three dollars, ten dollars, or even fifty dollars. This is how fortunes and jobs are created. An entrepreneur starts a business, sells some or all of its ownership, and uses the resulting capital to start and build other businesses. That's the secret of wealth. Workers, on the other hand, spend their time selling only their time. Mariotti also explains that ultimately owning a business isn't necessarily the main goal of his program, because knowing what it takes to be an owner also can make someone a very valuable employee. Knowing what it takes means that you can put things into context, academic things like math and reading. Um, he's found that when um, he's teaching uh, high school students how to run a business, then suddenly other things click for them. History, math, reading, they can, they can put it into context and it means something for them. And knowing that, that ownership, owning something, a business or land or something, knowing that this is an option surely makes anyone feel less helpless. And that spirit of ownership can do so much when translated into our daily lives. If we treat our possessions and times as things we own in our, own, in our micro economy of our household, we're more apt to make wiser investments, spend time on things that contribute to our little economic world, and remember you own whatever skills you happen to have picked up over the years. They can't take that away from you. There once was a time when a large majority of people thought that way, kind of by necessity. Perhaps you've heard recently of some new data on demographics in the United States. The percentage of people in the United States who live in rural areas is now down to an all-time low of 16.3%. Just 10 years ago, it was 20%. 100 years ago, the rural population of the US was 72%. All those farms and those small communities built around, around those farms and also mining too. And I think it's really hard to understate the the immense cultural ramifications of this downward, downward spiral. Farming and rural lifestyle pretty much require a measure of self-sufficiency skills. Growing and preserving your own food, being able to build and repair your home or your machinery, sewing blankets and clothes and other day-to-day -day items, that's just a part of rural life. It always, it always has been. And then that's not to say that every farmer or farmer's wife knows how to sew, but for the most part, they do. And, it, and it's, it's just because out of necessity, because you live 15, 20, 30 miles away from a store. And people aren't born with these kinds of skills. Societies are made of what we pass down to each generation and to each other. And it troubles me to think of all those life skills that come from farms and, and rural communities and that spirit of ownership. It troubles me to think we're losing all that simply because this legacy is dead ending. In this county, Marathon County alone, there are more than 1,000 fewer working farms than there were just a few decades ago. In this county alone, that's 1,000 fewer families passing down the spirit, the know-how, things like growing food, managing the land, tending to the life, tending to life day to day without a convenience store around the corner. It's very different when you don't have a convenience store around the corner. Your life is different. But these things are not rocket science either. Last week, I uh, spent an evening at a food, planning, a food canning class at a rural home, a friend of mine. And this is a young family, and they bought an old farm a few years ago. And they're gradually adopting the ways of farm life, even though neither one of them comes from a farming background. They just kind of dreamed. I think it started with a love of gardening, and they just, they just wanted to build on that. And they're gradually adopting a farm life. <clears throat> and um, even though both the husband and wife have professional jobs in town that they work at, well, they have in their large garden, they now grow much of their own food. And their basement is full of, it's, the walls are lined with fruits and vegetables and soups and sauces that, that they made from their land. And every now and again, they joke that uh, as um, sometimes when they have an extra expense or maybe just for the heck of it, they have survival week where they only eat what they have in, what they have in the house. But they can do it. I've, I've, seen their, I've seen their stuff. They've got plenty of food down there. It all came from their own land. 
And pretty soon, they're looking at having chickens and a couple of beef cattle, too. And they didn't learn this all from their parents, um, but they learned, they picked this up from resources that are available. There are so many resources out there um, on the internet, or like I mentioned before, the UW extensions. And they also learned it from their country neighbors. You know, their neighbors who have, who have uh, beef cattle said, sure, I'll help you raise a couple, or you know, some chicken farmers who gave them some, some hints. So they started with some basic know-how. That's where it started, just with some basic know-how, and they're working themselves up. Now, my newfound knowledge of canning marinara sauce isn't going to change my life, no matter how good it tastes. And realistically, the level of canning and food preservation that, that I do at this point really probably only saves me, save me maybe a couple hundred a year, <clears throat> a couple hundred dollars a year tops, you know. But if I kick, up, kick it up a notch, it might be more. But there is great satisfaction in knowing how to make yet another thing that you don't have to buy from someone else and knowing that you're just a little less helpless than you were before. It's just another link in a chain of value-added things and skills that we can own. My basic message is that it's so important throughout our lives and in raising our children to pursue those big and small steps of self-sufficiency and ownership to own valuable things, both tangible and intangible. Because no matter what happens in this economy, these are the things that, unlike a paycheck, nobody can take. Thank you. I think we'll take about a 10 minute break now. There's coffee and cookies in back there, so feel free to help yourself. Thank you again for coming tonight.